Hi everyone. I want to talk about fruit salmon. Thanks for watching my videos and I hope that you will subscribe because if you do, you'll be able to get all these presentations immediately they are published. Now, fruit semi is a loop or isolin diuretic. Some people will call it water pill. Are you familiar with fruit semi? If not, just sit back and you get yourself educated in the next few minutes. Okay, with that, let's go. Fruit could be known depending on the pharmaceutical company with the brand names in your jurisdiction. But worldwide, Lysis is the commonest, so you could know it to be Lysis or apofluosemide, or PMS fluosemide, biofluosemide, or teva fluosemide. Belongs to the class of medications called diuretics, and specifically is one of the loop or isolin diuretics. Is commonly known to be antihypertensive. Other members in that group, that is isolin diuretics or loop diuretic, would be bumetanine, tosimide, and etacrinic acid. We use etacrinic acid when someone is allergic to sulfonamide and the allergy is preventing the use of rosemine because anyone that is allergic to sulfonamide cannot use prosomine. Therefore, we choose the acrylic acid because they belong to the same class. Uses of frosemine uh, in ascites, that is secondary to liver cirrhosis or any hepatic failure situation, any loss of fluid in the salt space or in the abdomen there, or pulmonary edema. Peripheral edema, generalized edema, that is anasaka, acute renal failure, and of course, hypertension. This is or fusemine, could be in various forms, in form of tablet as 20 milligram, 40 milligram, 80 milligram, and of course generic will appear in those dosage forms also. And you could find Fusemi in oral solution form. An example would be 8 mg per meal or 10 mg per meal. You could also give Fusemi intravenously or intramuscular injection and to appear in form of 10 mg per meal. So you do your calculation when you need to administer. In ascites, secondary to liver cirrhosis, liver failure, or whatever, um, you give frusemine and for the fear of potassium uh, loss, you add spironolactone. But actually, you need spironolactone because if the ascites is secondary to uh, hepatic failure with port hypertension, you have to give a dosterone antagonist. And the dosterone antagonist that we are going to select here will be spironolactone. And with that, you'll be able to save the level of potassium when you use Semine that is going to send out the potassium as from a lot of that is potassium sparing will reduce the rate at which the potassium will be lost. But if you are dealing with ascites and hyperkalemia, you are free to use frosemine only because, in that case, you are not going to add spironolactone that will retain potassium in the face of hyperkalemia.
If not, I'm going to treat the patient to hyperkalemic state with you know, associated cardiac arrhythmia that may lead to fatality. For absolute outcome or great outcome, you can actually start with metolazone, that is Zalzolin, 30 minutes before you add spironolactone and then add your flusemide. So the three medications will be great in handling your ascites. Flusemide could be at the dose of 40 mg and spironolactone at 100 mg and metolazone at 2.5 mg. But the value of potassium will determine how far you can go and the dosage of the respective diuretics here. For example, 40 mg per hour once daily will be fine, but you could go as high as 160 mg per day. In pulmonary edema, you can give intravenous 20 to 40 mg start and you titrate as needed. Per oral route is less available to handle the pulmonary edema. So, in other words, if your diagnosis is anything to do with pulmonary edema and you are thinking as per the usage of flusemine, go for intravenous route. From oral to IV, you can start at twice the total oral daily dose. An IV infusion should be at 5 mg per hour. If the glomerular filtration rate is less than 30 mg per minute, you can give 20 mg per hour start, you can increase that to 40 mg per hour, and watch out as per the side effects. But if you are converting from IV route to per hour, you can use 1 to 2 dose of the IV dosage. In renal impairment, like acute kidney injury, but not in oligary cases, you can use one gram daily to start the initial desired response. In hepatic impairment, you can give high doses of flusemine that will lead to increased apokalemia and volume depletion sensitivity. There will be diminished natriuretic effect, so be watchful in hepatic impairment. In pediatrics, you are free to give as high as 1 to 2 mg per kilogram per hour start, then you can increase by 1 mg per kilogram per dose every 8 hours to get the desired effect. That you know you have to be watching or keeping an eye on the level of potassium. You can give 0 0.5 to 2 mg per kilogram per dose IM or IV every 6 to 12 hours. You may increase the dose by 1 mg per kilogram per dose. The maximum dose allowed is 6 mg per kilogram per dose. For infusion, can give IV bolus 0.1 mg per kilogram, followed by continuous IV infusion of 0.05 to 0.4 mg per kilogram per hour. Then you titrate to the desired effect. What are the possible adverse reactions? Hypotension. Remember, when I started, I said you can use flusemine to treat hypertension. So, it goes without saying that any agent you use to deal with hypertension will give you hypotension because that is the goal, to bring the BP down. But when we say hypotension, it means you've gone below the optimum parameter. Okay, dizziness, of 
because when fluid is lost and there's hypertension, it's likely put off dizziness, paresthesia, restlessness, vertigo, thrombophilobitis, vasculitis, necrotizing angiitis, pemphigoi, erythema motiforme, and deafness. But let me pause as per deafness. Remember a scenario when I was in school, was in medical school, we had a young man that was broad with nephrotic syndrome. And the young man was properly not treated and he lost the anasaka, that is generalized body swelling. But he came in able to talk to us and able to respond, meaning he could hear, he could communicate. But by the time we were done, man, he was dead. And though we got the fluid out, but the fluid in the hair also gone. Perilymph, the endolymph. Still on adverse effects or adverse reactions, glycosuria and hyperglycemia. So you need to watch it. In individual with diabetes mellitus, hyperuricemia, so you have to be careful in people with gout, Stephen Johnson syndrome, or toxic epidermal necrolysis. So you need to be sure there's no hypersensitivity. Constipation is possible bladder spasm, abdominal cramps, pancreatitis, granulocytosis, and of course, anemia. Still on adverse reactions, could be aplastic anemia, sinophilia, hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, empathic encephalopathy, jaundice, and raise hepatic enzymes. Here on adverse effect or adverse reactions, someone might be whispering to you, why giving the medication if you are going to be faced with this gamut of reactions? Well, it is what it is. Tinnitus, dress syndrome, that is drug rash with isomophilia and systemic symptoms. Muscle weakness, fever, allergic interstitial nephritis, nephrotoxicity, photosensitivity, and of course, we always explain to the patient the probability of ototoxicity and nephrotoxicity. And that is why you need to watch out drug drug reaction. So, someone is on frosemine and needs to undo bacterial infection, be careful with aminoglycosides. One is too high for semi will lead to severe fluid and electrolyte loss. So we'll be dealing with dehydration and electrolyte loss, most significantly potassium level, hypokalemia. Prusemine can give apocasemia, leading to arrhythmia. Apocasemia is possible from what I've said as per adverse effects that will lead to gout. Don't give in patients with sober allergy because they'll be sensitive if they're sensitive to sober. And then you use etaclinic acid in that case. Don't use in adrenal insufficiency. In cirrhosis, don't let hepatic encephalopathy occur due to electrolyte and acid-based imbalances. So you get your arterial blood gases and you'll be monitoring the pH and the level of the electrolyte. Be cautious in diabetic patients because of glycosuria and possibility of hyperglycemia. You don't give flucemine in BPA, benign prostatic hypertrophy, 
or benign prostatic hyperplasia. In systemic lupus erythematosus, prosemine might not be the best choice because it can cause increased flare. As per drug drug interaction, I will limit myself to the piece of advice here. Contact your pharmacist because there are a lot of medications that semi will react with. But let me just leave this. When you are administering through semi, you're going to have some few things at the back of your mind that is nephrotoxicity, ototoxicity, the fact that there could be dehydration, and possibility of up. Kalemia. So with that, you'll be able to guide the choices that you're going to make as per other type of medications to handle whatever the patient may be battling with concomitantly. Contraindications. Hypersensitivity to sulfonamide derived drugs will make flucemide unwelcome. And complete renal shutdown will exclude the use of fruit semi. Hepatic coma from hepatic encephalopathy, you have to keep fruit semi off the table. In electrolyte depletion, particularly potassium level, please don't use fruit semi, don't add to the problem. If there is hypokalemia and you still need to use any form of diuretic agent, you are free to use a dosterone antagonist. And on that list, we'll be able to pick spironolactone, amyloride, or triamterene. In hypovolemic situations, please keep flucemine off the table because flucemine on its own will send fluid out, and now the individual is hypovolemic, then are going to do more harm than good. In individual that's already dehydrated, they don't need flucemine anymore because you are going to worsen the situation for them. You're going to send the remaining fluid out of the system. In Johnny's baby or Canicturus, please keep flucemide off the table. And of course, in breastfeeding mothers, because they actually need the fluid to help in make let down reflex and the child will be able to be fed appropriately. So when you keep them through semi, you dry off everything. And with that, I've come to the end of this presentation. If you have any comments, you can leave comment at the comment session. Thank you for listening. Can you remember to subscribe to my channel so that you can get my presentations immediately they're published. Thank you, I appreciate that.